Hello, my name is Mark Blythe and I am the director of the Road Centre for International Economics and Finance at the Watson Institute at Brown University. On the Road Centre podcast this week, I was had a great conversation with Vivian Schmidt. Vivian is a professor at Boston University and also happens to be the person who I think knows more about the internal workings of the EU than practically anyone else on the planet. She has also just written this wonderful book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by the Numbers in the Eurozone. Although this book deals with the last Eurozone crisis, that is, the uh, mishandling of the um, financial crisis in 2010, which morphed into the Euro crisis, the whole austerity episode, etc., and the long 10-year recession that Europe went through, particularly in Southern Europe, what it's also about is how Europe has a kind of structural problem with legitimacy amongst its own members, and how in the current moment, in the COVID crisis, those same dynamics may come back to haunt us. It's a great chat, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Vivian. Hi. Nice to see you, Mark. Where are you exactly? I'm actually on the Italian coast, the Italian Riviera, between right on the border with France, between Ventimiglia and Menton. Now, isn't that sort of appropriate, given the fact that you're writing or have written this wonderful book we're about to talk about, uh, which is called Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone, when you're talking about France and you're talking about Italy. Now, we're going to get to all the sort of wonderful dynamics of Italy past and present, legitimacy, etc. But let's get started. Why did you want to write a book about legitimacy? It's a particularly slippery topic for social scientists and particularly for institutions like the EU. And here's what I mean by that. You can say that Trump is legitimate or illegitimate. There was an election. There's a guy called Trump. There's an office he holds. You like it or you don't like it. You can say that Boris Johnson is legitimate or illegitimate, given his handling of the COVID crisis, but he is the duly elected person, right? With the EU, hardly anybody knows how it works, what the bits are, what the bits do, so how do you write about the legitimacy of the organization? What is it you're trying to get at? Well, so first, let me answer the question about legitimacy. And I decided that legitimacy was the perfect lens through which to consider all aspects of the Eurozone crisis. Most people look at either political economy or the politics or the governance. And I thought the only way to pull it all together was to actually ask questions about legitimacy where all of these are connected. And in particular for the EU, where in the Eurozone crisis, legitimacy was massively in question. So how do you think about legitimacy? There are two ways of thinking about it. One is sort of the most basic way, public consent in or trust uh, in a governing authority. It's public consent, but it's also public acceptance of governing activities which reinforce or undermine governing activity. In the EU, governing authority, minimal at first, is built up in area after area over time. Policies like in the customs union, international trade, the single market, the supremacy of EU law, the European Central Bank, all of these are slowly accepted at the national level by the people tacitly, by national governments explicitly. So how do institutions such as those garner their legitimacy, right? You know, the British monarchy has been around long enough that it's quasi-legitimate, right? But the ECB has only been around since 1999. How does the EJC, no one can tell you who an e a European jurist is. So how prior to the crisis did these institutions garner legitimacy? How did they go about getting legitimate? So this is all about governing activities. Because you're slowly building up governing authority, you do that by doing well in terms of your governing activities. And that's about policy performance. That's about political governing responsiveness. And that's about procedures. So this is where we get into three different types of legitimacy what I call input, output, and throughput. But if you don't like the systems concepts, that's fine. No, stick with it. Walk us through each one. Okay. So output uh, is about policy effectiveness performance. Input is about political participation by citizens, their representation, and governing responsiveness. And throughput which is procedural quality, is about efficacy, you know, competence in doing things, 
uh, accountability to a form of experts, to politicians, to the public, transparency with access to information, inclusiveness and openness, meaning open to all concerned citizens and interests. And these are the ways in which one needs to think about legitimacy. And this is the way the EU itself thought about its own legitimacy primarily. So if I'm not being too crude, because the book is more nuanced than this, but allow me a bit of vulgarity, what you what you essentially say is that it was really kind of output first, then it was input, and nobody really worried about throughput. And then the crisis hit, and then that kind of went haywire, and they had to rearrange their prioritization of different forms of legitimacy. Would you say that's fair? Well, what I would say is that initially, in the response, EU institutional actors, and we're talking about member state leaders as much as the commission and everyone else, thought all we have to do is reinforce the rules, uh, rigidify the numbers, and everything will be fine. We'll end up with good performance, and therefore it doesn't matter that the people haven't been involved. And of course, as we've seen, there were bad results. And that's because they also mis misframed the crisis as one of private debt as opposed to the reality of public debt. You've written a lot about this, in fact, and I even quote you in the book on this. Um, they, they not only misframed the crisis as public debt, they misdiagnosed it as a problem of behavior as opposed to the structure of the euro. The result was they ended up with the wrong remedies, austerity and structural reform, um, and no solutions, no European Monetary Fund, no Euro bonds. They finally got a banking union, but there's still no individual deposit insurance, mm -hmm. um, no unemployment insurance. In effect, no fiscal federalism, which is what you need to make this kind of monetary union work. Right. So, but let, let's try and stress the sort of the value added or the difference that you're inserting into the conversation here, because what you just described there was they got it wrong in the diagnosis and then they did wrong stuff. But the book actually is much more sophisticated than that. And it basically says, look, here's how this rather fragile, hierarchical Rube Goldberg thing did stuff. There was a variety of inputs. You had things like the parliament. It was kind of OK. And then you had outputs. And so long as everything was going great, as it was between 2000 and 2007, outputs, lovely, right? And nobody really thinks about the throughputs. Now, as you say, they doubled down on the rules. So that's, I mean, you can misframe something and then ignore the rules. Why did they double down on the rules? That's the important point of entry, I think, that you're making. So they first doubled down on the rules because they assume, as EU bureaucrats would, this is, after all, what they're supposed to do, is they follow the rules. But by doubling down on the rules, it all went wrong. And so the response then was, oh, wait a minute, this is a problem. We assume that all you have to do is good procedures and you get good performance and you don't pay attention to the people. Mm, no longer working, rise of populism, decline, deteriorating economics. And what you begin to see is they begin reinterpreting the rules by stealth. Mm. So for the commission, I call them at the beginning ayatollahs of austerity because they're the champions of austerity. Let's move forward into austerity and structural reform. But by 2012, they realized, uh-oh, this isn't working. And they became ministers of moderation mm. as they began reinterpreting the rules by stealth. Right. Also because they couldn't admit to it. And so what you got is actually a problem of legitimacy yet again, because they're getting better performance, but they're not telling the truth about right. their increasing discretion. Now, that's a really interesting insight to me on this one, because imagine a standard polity, right? Let's let's take let's take France, right? Let's let's take Italy even right? this very fragmented party system. If you have legitimacy on the front end, that is to say direct voter support and you have bad performance on the back end, if you're doubling down on rules, A, you will get called out on it and B, there's a political cost to be paid for changing your mind, but you can change your mind. You could be seen to change your mind. Why is it that within the EU system, they couldn't be seen to change their mind? Okay, well, you can change your mind at the national level. And if you don't change your mind, someone else will be elected. Right, And exactly. change it for you. At the EU level, that's not possible. It's dependent upon all these different member states. It's dependent on various institutional actors with diverging preferences, you know, having to deal with pretty rigid rules 
the league, the legality was also a problem. And that's why they essentially reinterpreted the rules by stealth. But the problem is you got incremental improvement, but you still had these suboptimal rules and perceptions of illegitimacy. And my way of thinking about this is that even as the commission in particular increased its flexibility, it engaged in a discourse of denial that led Southern Europeans to feel oppressed even when they were accommodated and Northern Europeans to feel deceived regardless. But just let me go back to one thing you said there. EU bureaucrats don't have someone sniping at their heels who wants to take their job in the way that you would in a political system. So doesn't that give them more freedom to actually go, look, you know, we thought the world worked this way. Turns out it doesn't. What sensible things should we do? We should change our minds. Doesn't that give them a bit more freedom, but they don't, they seem to lack the ability to take it? So it depends upon which institutional actor we're talking about. The commission is essentially accountable to the member state leaders in the council and to the European Parliament. It actually has administrative discretion, but relatively little room for maneuver. And it, it actually, to be fair to it, it took as much as it could mm -hmm. as it was reinterpreting the rules. Um, what's interesting is the European Central Bank, of course, has a tremendous amount of of independence and autonomy and actually could have done a lot more at the beginning. So, you know, when we ask questions about the legitimacy of the European Central Bank, you know, it's again a Janus faced question. Here is, was the, was the European Central Bank the hero of the crisis? Or was it the ogre? As a hero, you could say, well, it actually also reinterpreted the rules. Mm -hmm. In this case, in plain view, as it started with a very narrow mandate with cliche, where it claimed credibility was all, we're not a lender of last resort, as you yourself wrote about. And then slowly but surely, by 2012, Mario Draghi says, actually, it's not so much about cred credibility as stability. And he reinterprets the mandate to allow for open monetary transactions in 2012, the I'll do everything to save the euro quote, which stops market attacks in their tracks. And then by 2015, you get quantitative easing. Now, this makes Mario Draghi in particular, but the ECB the hero of the crisis. However, you can read it completely the opposite way and say, actually, it was the ogre. Because in exchange for doing anything, it kept saying, we want it pushed the member states to austerity, to structural reform, push the program countries, the countries in trouble into deep, deep austerity, harsh austerity, and really punishing structural reform programs. And at the same time, you could say, and look how slowly it acted. You know, delayed its response, OMT only in 2012, QE only in 2015, whereas the American Fed and the, um, the Bank of England, they were doing quantitative easing in massive amounts right from the beginning. So was it the hero of the crisis or was it the ogre? And that Janus face quality, again, to bring it back to legitimacy, you still see this playing out now with the German Constitutional Court. Because in a sense, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, no, 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 legitimacy of this organization still comes from adherence to the rules. And you guys are going beyond the rules by reinterpreting the rules and we're calling you on it. So is this conflict over what is legitimate action and what is not kind of built into the architecture of the EU on a deep level? Well, I'll take the German constitutional court and add it to the position of Germany because this is all about German power in the end, because it's only the German constitutional court saying, we have to consider German democracy. No one else can do this. And um, here for the council, the Janus faced behavior is, is, is the council a dictatorship led by Germany? It's all about German economic interests and political interests, as well as legal with the constitutional court. Or on the other hand, was this a mutually accountable deliberative body? From 2010 to 2012, it certainly looks like a dictatorship, but thereafter you get an acceptance, the Italians push for growth, and then Merkel says, okay, okay, growth and stability. And then the Italians again, this is next, Renzi comes in in 2014 and says, no, we, we need flexibility as well. And she said, okay, okay, stability with flexibility. Have cake and eat it, right? <laughs> exactly, but what you see is there's movement. So it can't right. just be a dictatorship, but it's 
is it a mutually accountable body? There's also a question there because when you have a gun at your head, mm -hmm. you know, and you're Portugal, you agree. But if you're a program country, this is probably deliberative authoritarianism yeah. or in the case of Greece, harsh authoritarianism, harsh dictatorship with no deliberation in the third bailout. So let's think about where we are now with all of this. We still have these different crises or different channels of legitimacy. And we now have the COVID lockdown. So basically, Europe loses a decade, particularly the South. They still have double digit unemployment going into the crisis in many of these countries in the South. And coming out of it, there's been the whole discussion of Italy's need, if not for a bailout, then for relief. There was the abortive cry for euro bonds, which then became corona bonds, which now become basically the Dutch saying, we can give you more loans, which nobody actually needs, because the problem is they have too much debt and they can't pay exactly. it back, right? So are we doomed to repeat this? Are we just heading for yet another crisis along exactly the same metrics? That is to say, the politics is irrevocably changed. You've got populists on the ground. You've got fragmented party systems. Input's gone. Output, right? It was just about getting better and now it's gotten a lot worse. Throughput, you've basically still got the same rules on the books. So how do they how do they navigate this? How do they make this work for the EU going forward? So what's interesting about this is that I was very pessimistic in the very early days. Uh, the EU is very slow to start. It was completely inefficient on the procedural grounds. You know, this was the Eurozone crisis déjà vu all over again. The council was unaccountable. It failed to act. Member states pursued their own policies. But the silver lining in this is that they were completely anti-austerity policies. Yes, yeah, true. This was about spending, spending, spending at the national level to make it possible for people to quarantine, to isolate, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. But Member States Act, Council doesn't. The ECB claims it's not in its mandate to deal with the spreads between Germany and, you know, yeah. Italian, Which German and Italian Which begs the question bonds. exactly what your mandate is then, but never mind. Exactly, exactly. The European Parliament has no role and the Commission is nowhere. And it looks like the mi migration crisis again. Right. Uh, with national level borders going up, each dealing with its own issues, export bans of key equipment. But I think the important piece is that after a couple of weeks, things change dramatically. The member states, as I've said, throw out Euro, Euro crisis budgetary austerity, even if the rules are still on the books, which is a danger. The ECB, after its misstep, becomes the hero yet again without the ogre-like demands for austerity and structural reform for the countries needing help. The council is no longer a dictatorship by Germany. On the contrary, it looks like a deliberative, mutually accountable body pushed by German, Germany and France together. Mm -hmm. And the commission are immediately ministers of moderation, suspending budgetary cri criteria to allow unlimited government spending, suspending state aid rules, recommending a multi-annual financial framework that's masses beyond where it was before, recommending unemployment insurance fund, some form of corona bonds, and actually they come up with more than the French and Germans had asked for with a fund of 750 billion euro fund where two thirds of it would go to uh, grants and only one third debt. So what I'm hopeful is that we will have enough push for a new kind of investment. Um, let's call them not just Corona bonds, but green bonds and a sort of a reset of the European economy, because that's what the EU needs is a reset. Just like actually all economies after 30, 40 years of neoliberalism need a reset, need to confront climate change, need to confront future pandemics in a way that makes sense, which is throwing out the old neoliberalism, the old rules, and recognizing that debt's not the enemy. Lack of growth is the enemy. But they still have those rules on the books, and that would worry me. And the second one is, the politics on the ground have changed at a national level. So what you're describing, which I think sounds like a great idea, is still a kind of technocratic top-down, we're going to do this and it's Europe and we speak with one voice. And the reality on the ground is they don't speak with one voice. They're increasingly discordant and dissonant, not just north-south, but also east-west. 
and not just sort of parliamentarians versus populists, but like fragmented party systems across the place. Latest opinion polls in France that I saw has um, the family business that is the French nationalists back up there with Macron. The biggest surprise in the recent elections were the Greens again. So again, let's talk about legitimacy. That may be a series of good ideas, but do these institutions have the legitimacy to carry it off, given that the domestic foundations of support, which they took for granted, have become rather fractured? So very important question, and I worry myself about this. But what's interesting is to see what's happened to the populist anti-system forces in the crisis, uh, as well as the mainstream parties. In any number of countries, uh, where they've responded um, effectively, uh, with efficacy and transparency and accountability to the crisis. So here we've got output and throughput. Mm -hmm. uh, the input legitimacy has increased. Right. Uh, Angela Merkel, 80% popularity and the AFD gone down. Um, France is a more complicated question. And is it just France? Is it just uh, Macron? Or, actually just Macron, but they haven't been so bad in the response. Mm, mm. Italy, what's fascinating is the, you know, five-star populist party with the um, PD, the Partito Demo Democratico, so the yeah. Democratic Party, the former, you know, social Democrats, mm -hmm. um, have actually been doing well. Conte, the prime minister, has good popularity, and Salvini is losing. Not much, Salvini is losing, points. but Fratelli d'Italia is booming is up. Yeah, right. no, it's there's a very always mixed picture. A very mixed picture. But it suggests that populists out of power um, are losing to some extent, mm. assuming that the mainstream parties are doing a reasonable job. Uh, the issue is, what about populists in power? And here you get a mixed bag. Trump in the U.S. not doing well because he's messed up mm -hmm. uh, in terms of crisis response. In Central Eastern Europe, Orban doesn't seem to be doing too badly. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are problems, but, you know, in Poland, it's a question. But basically, so it's such a mixed bag, we can't make any generalizations. I think the only thing we can say is that the only thing we can hope for is that mainstream parties in power, along with the populist parties doing a decent job in the pandemic, actually address the economic issues, the health issues in a way that everyone begins to feel better, that you no longer have people angry because they feel left behind mm -hmm. in terms of the, of the socioeconomics, so that you no longer have people who feel after feeling left behind with the socioeconomics are also worried about loss of status, right. even if they're slightly richer. And here you've got the difference between the urban areas and the peri-urban and the rural. Um, you know, and it's, you know, it's also about the migration crisis. How do we fix that? Right. Um, identity politics. But at the same time, it's also, and this is the key about, you know, to respond to your mm. question about the EU, it's also about the politics of take back control. The EU has to become less democratic. It has to have more bottom up politics rather than top down for, you know, it's the Eurozone crisis was a recipe for disaster. Because all of a sudden, the EU started dictating policies to everyone, but in particular, Southern Europe, and they were the wrong ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you need is more decentralization and democratization of the EU. You know, let the EU do what it needs to do, what all the member states need for the EU to do to coordinate policies at the same time that the EU needs to give back to the national level responsibility over their own economics at the same time that it provides the kind of funding necessary for economies like Italy and Spain to grow again, because that's actually the only way you're getting out of populism. Now, this, this would be a tough agenda on its own, but let's put this in the new global context. So it's not out of the question that despite failing catastrophically on many vectors, President Trump gets re-elected. At which point in time, basically, the, Euro the European car industry, aviation industry, what, what, what it passes for its digital sector is going to get absolutely slaughtered by American tariffs. And then you have China, 
And China is doubly interesting because not only does it want the EU to pick a side, and it's not a side that you want to be on for all of America's problems, you can actually still somewhat rely on property rights, courts, and such things like this. What you have on the Chinese side is a divide and conquer strategy whereby if they don't do what the smaller states, particularly in the South and East, want, they'll get bought off and thereby fragment the EU, which is a bets the Russian strategy for dealing with the EU. So for the first time in its grown-up existence, it faces real geostrategic threats. So does this basically allow it to garner legitimacy for these types of actions that it needs to do? Or is the legitimacy or lack thereof the weak point in responding to these things in an adequate, scaled up manner? How is it going to play out? You know, this is the big, you know, this is the major question for the EU. Is it going to step up to the plate? Right. Is it going to recognize that actually it's in a really bad neighborhood? It needs to be more inter do more on security and defense and possibly have a CSDP merge with NATO, that they take over NATO, that they step up to the plate on security, recognizing that's a problem. But they also need to have their own digital revolution. Uh, they need, you know, they need the Green New Deal. They use need investment to shift the European countries' capitalisms. They need to do all of this at the same time. At, the, at a point at which it can go either way. So if the EU doesn't step up to the plate, then it's going to become, you know, the Disney world for the world, you know, Disney, um, medieval and Renaissance uh, now, travel work, tourism Well, that for would the work world. if you had tourism, but, you know, post-COVID, we might not with, even have that. So No, exactly. So in a way, I see no alternative for the EU. I either see a situation where it can it moves forward rapidly in all the ways that I mentioned earlier, or that it just it won't even fall apart. It will simply stagnate. Yeah. And you will see rising populisms. You see, you'll see it in, you know, Central Eastern Europe going its own way into kind of authoritarian populism. You'll see weak democracies continue. But, you know, mm. Brexit started the breakup. I think that if the EU moves fast, moves forward fast, that's it. Britain will come begging back after 20 years in the cold, harsh Atlantic, or, or um, Brexit is the first of many exits. Right. One final question, because the, the time scale on that something good, something bad is, is, is indeterminate. And also because have they missed a trick? Now, I'm going to ask you this one. So the, the focus on euro bonds and debt mutualization and latterly corona bonds has always focused on the economic questions. That is to say, fiscal capacity, fiscal space, uh, debt reduction, blah, 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 all of which is true and warranted. But there's another thing. The United States runs the global economy because it has the dollar. The United States is increasingly badly run. We are basically a failed state with nukes. Now, if you stepped up to the plate and gave the world another alternative asset to buy, that is common euro-denominated debt. Let's say you issued 20% of eurozone GDP. Everybody would buy it. And if you did that, you would then have power and autonomy, and you would basically have something you could beat back on both China and the US. Now, if this is obvious to me, and it's obvious to you, why is it the people who are in charge of this thing are so hesitant to even talk about that in public? Um, this is about ideas and discourse, back to discursive institutionalism, but it really is a question of how, well, in terms of the Eurozone crisis, how it was misframed. Um, now what we see is there's a kind of recognition that they have to move forward, but they haven't gotten there yet. Mm. But this is a first step. What we do recognize is that the ECB um, can do more, that this could be the very beginning because the EU for the first time will have its own bonds. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's a market out there. There's a and huge the, market. A huge market and, and, and people in the EU recognize it. But it means, this means that Merkel who's already changed her tune, and Macron have to convince the frugal four that this is no longer about de debt. Mm -hmm. This is about interdependence of European economies and societies. Yes. And that if they don't do something fast and recognize that, you know, this is enlightened self-interest, if not 
common identity. Uh, Northern Europe is not going to survive if it doesn't have markets in, in, in Southern Europe. Mm-hmm. Central and Eastern Europe is not going to survive unless it keeps getting the cohesion and structural funds from, you know, from yeah. the center. All of this means that you need, you need EU sourced funds. You need a serious EU budget and uh, EU's own resources. So this is a tall order for countries that have con- continued to think in very narrow minded terms with blinders on about it's me, it's them. How much can we get? So this this requires a massive reframing, a massive persuasive exercise in convincing people that it's the future we have to think about, not the past. And we all have to do it together in Europe. Otherwise, we're lost. It's a dangerous world out there between the U.S., China, Russia, uh, continued turmoil in the Middle East, uh, migratory pressure from Africa. You know, the EU needs to pull together or it will fall apart. Well, I, I hope you're right. You know, I, I, the most dominant um, theory of European integration, as you well know, has been functionalism, which is basically one bloody thing makes another bloody thing happen. Let's hope that with enough bloody things on their plate, that continues to happen. Thank you very much for the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. This episode of the Road Centre podcast was produced by Dan Richards. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favourite podcast app. If you like us, rate us on iTunes and help others find the podcast as well. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu slash roads. Thanks for listening.